Okay, cool. Uh, thank you very much, Kirsten. So since this is the, I'm gonna stop, um, yeah, so since this is the last session, um, I think we should all give the wonderful Zhixing a big round of applause for, for the wonderful um, work she had done. And of course, Kirsten and, and, and Dan, and just, you know, to, to bring everybody together. Um, I'm, I feel so touched kind of by, by this community and like that's, you know, come around John. Uh, you know, to see, you know, everyone just flying in, you know, from everywhere, like Mark, this is, you know, his second <laughs> to John's conference. Um, it, it's very touching. And I think it says a lot about John and, you know, his, his influence on, on everybody that, you know, when he was physically around that, you know, he would always bring people together to introduce like new people to bring people together. And now he's, you know, physically not here, but he's still doing the same thing. Right. So, and, and I think that that really says that really says a lot. Um, and it kind of reminds me of uh, the now infamous 2018 TCMC, <laughs> a bit that, uh, so Mark was, you know, telling the story, of, you know, that John was responsible for providing the grant to, to make TCMC happen. But then, you know, like, you know, towards the end, you know, the day to day kind of, you know, working of the conference, he was um, on a holiday in Hawaii. And I thought, and I thought that was quite fitting because he's also on holiday now, right? Like, it's like, you know, he's, he, he's the inspiration behind all of this, you know, he's a reason why we're here, but um, the day-to-day -day working now, it's, you know, due to somebody else. So I think that's, uh, <laughs> that, that's quite fitting. Um, and so I, I first met John, you know, at this 2018 QCMC. Uh, and unlike a lot of people, I, I heard John before I, I met him. And, and, and not just, you know, audio, like hearing, but uh, we had, you know, so many mutual people in common that I heard about John. Um, you know, for, for maybe a few years before I, I actually um, I actually met him. So I felt like I knew him before I met him, but I wasn't maybe quite prepared when I actually when I actually met him. Uh, so, so, so my family's here in Australia. So I would come to Australia and I'll meet, you know, John here. Uh, and then in Tim Burns group, you know, I would, uh, he would be visiting, you know, Tim for uh, many weeks in the year and I'll just tag along like every day, like for, for weeks on end. And they were just, just su super, super fun. I mean, um, no papers came out. I think we had almost one paper that I don't know what happened to it um, <laughs> with, with John, but uh, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. I think Xu Xing probably said something similar. Like, you know, um, you know I, I just I just learned so much. And, and one thing I really love about John is that he also epitomized the, like understanding the distinction between seriousness and solemnness. Because I, I, so I think, you know, you, you hear a lot about, oh, you know, John's crazy, like, you know, this or that. But actually, like for me, he was always very serious. Like, I mean, on the surface, you know, he's crazy and, you know, um, and, and all of that, but he's, he's serious, but he's not solemn. So, so, so there, there's a big, big distinction. And you can really tell um, because, you know, in, in everything he says, there's really almost absolutely no pretension at all. And I think that that really allows you to get, you know, um, uh, uh, a very, very clear mind. Like for me, his mind was always very, very clear, except when he was drunk. But, you know, every, every other time he was very, very clear. He, like very, very clear thought processes. And even when he's like, <laughs> really like he, because he, he kind of, he uses humor as a way of getting to the truth. Like that, that that's how I, that's how I always saw, um, uh, saw that. Um, uh, so, and, and the other part of John that he kind of has these dual qualities uh, is he's both, you know, very genuine, very real. And on the other hand, very, you know, otherworldly. Like, I, I don't know, like, and kind of, almost a little bit magical, I, I would say, like, um, and, and it's actually how I feel about physics. And I think maybe that's all how we feel about physics. Like it's both very, very real, like we are, you know, studying the actual universe, it's real. And it's on the other side, it's very crazy, right? You know, like all of us do quantum mechanics, right? And it's a bit um, otherworldly. So, um, and this is also epitomized by, by, by this picture. I don't know how many of you guys have seen this picture. Um, of, yeah, <laughs> okay. okay. So, uh, well, um, if you were friends with John on Facebook, this is actually also his background picture. But but I saw this picture, you know, way before I, I knew John. So I, so this is a, uh, from a movie called The Time Machine. Um, yeah. So so this is actually an Australian actor. I think his name is uh, Guy Guy Pierce. Um, and, and this movie came out when I was in in junior high. So uh, yeah, obviously I didn't know John. But I uh, it, so it's based on a book by H. G. Wells about this you know this scientist. I think his my fiance died and then uh so he's trying to invent a time machine to kind of prevent you know the accident that, that killed his fiance but I, I actually don't remember any part of the movie at all 
okay, except this one. Like it, it made such a strong impression on me, uh, uh, on me at the time because I was so fascinated uh, just by that beginning. I, I, I didn't care what happened <laughs> in, the, in the rest of the movie because I think, um, because I, you know, I learned about relativity and you know, all that um, at that time, and, and somehow, even though you know what equations you write, there is bogus. Like it's got nothing to do with uh, time travel. But somehow, you have this magical thinking that somewhere, you know, there exists this universe where, you know, there are equations that would tell you, you know, how to do these crazy things, right? So, so that kind of feeling um, is always there. So it's always in the back of my mind, like kind of this image of him, like going on the board, and and I always wanted to know what the equations are, even though I know if I really see it, you know, it's uh, it's going to destroy the magic. So um, about maybe a year, I don't know how many of you guys know this story, but um, uh, yeah, maybe a year and a year and a half after I knew John, John actually uh, told the story that he was actually a consultant uh, for this movie and he was responsible for those equations. So, <laughs> um, so, so that kind of, uh, I mean, it sounds silly to say because, you know, just a movie, but it kind of blew my mind a bit because somehow, like the, the magic that you feel when you're really young and it's somehow now connected with something that is real, like when you're older. So, so uh, and I think that just, uh, that's a good example of how John makes you feel. I don't know, but um, yeah. Uh, sorry? Uh, well, actually, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, so, so for the fun session, the little activity is, so, so I have a blow up of the, of the blackboard equation so, so John told me that, I don't know if you remember this, Tim, but, uh, but John said that he hid his signature, like, like in there. So, so, so for the fun session, you guys can like try and find where he put it. I actually, I actually forgot where it is. So it would be very useful if someone can, uh, can find it. Okay, cool. Uh, so I'll stop my proper talk now. Um, oh yes, oh. Uh, uh, oh, can someone play the... Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah, I I I I spent a lot of time doing this. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So 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 speaking about like crazy, but you know, um, uh, a crazy magical, but still real. I'm going to talk about quantum computing. Okay. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So this is going to be a, a series of works uh, that I did like last year, but it's on the same theme which is quantum algorithms for ordinary and, and partial differential equations. And, and so I'm going to talk about three different, if I have time, I'm going to talk about three uh, different aspects of you know, how we can use quantum algorithms for these differential equations. Now, uh, I, I think with quantum algorithms, like you know, um, differential equations seems to be like a, quite a small subset of attention, but really like all the laws in physics that we care about, they're all in this form, right? Ordinary or partial differential equations. So it's really, really important for us to understand uh, you know, if it's possible for us to use quantum devices to, you know, for, for some kind of advantage, okay? Uh, and I named this, uh, like, one aspect Schrodingerization because if we want to use a quantum device, somehow we want to turn, like, non-Schrodinger-like equations into Schrodinger-like, you know, equations, right, to, uh, to be able to form these algorithms. And the main theme is that we can actually solve a lot of these problems by mapping the original differential equation uh, into a higher dimensional space. Okay, because with classical devices, if you want to increase dimensions, you're going to have a cursor dimensionality problem. But with quantum devices, the benefit is that if you increase dimensions, you, you won't get this. Well, not, not all the time. Okay? Well, I mean, at least there are subsets of problems in which you won't get this uh, cursor dimensionality. So if you're able to solve certain problems, like you know, problems with nonlinearity, with stochasticity, uh, then uh, it will be good to move to these high dimensions. So these are kind of techniques which maybe the classical people, you know, would ignore, maybe won't care about because, you know, it would incur the cursor dimensionality on, on their systems, but it's actually a, a really good opportunity for quantum algorithms, right, to, to look at these techniques. Uh, whoops. So is it this one or the other one? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that, 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 that's okay. It's a lot of blah blah. So I because I don't know how long I've been blah blahing. So I'll, I'll get to the point. Okay. So 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 what are the kinds of problems that can potentially benefit? Okay. So I, so I, um, our focus now is on high dimensional uh, problems, and, and I'll talk about the the three you know like how do we take uh, advantage of going to high dimensions? So I'll, uh, in one aspect, 
um, I'll, I'll introduce a way of, uh, if we transform our problem into higher dimension, we can turn nonlinear problems into linear problems. Okay, so we all know how, how easy it is, or like how much easy it is to work with, you know, uh, linear problems. And nonlinear problems are really where classical people have a lot of problems. Um, because, you know, we have a lot of quantum algorithms, where, you know, when I talk to classical people say, well, we don't actually like need your help, like they're bad. <laughs> but what we really, what we really want to, or we care about um, nonlinear problems. Uh, uh, we also have examples where uh, if you have a stochastic problem, you can actually turn it into, you know, a deterministic one, okay, by, by mapping into a slightly higher, higher dimension. And the last one, which is the, the latest one, which I think is very cute, and I would like, you know, all your input on, actually, uh, all the experts in the room. Um, so, so a new way of turning non-Schrodinger-like equations into Schrodinger-like uh, equations. Right, and, and what the uses are. So again, you know, uh, like these techniques, if you try and do these classically, it'll be costly, but there's a potential for them to be now efficient, okay, if we use quantum algorithms. Okay, uh, okay so, so, so this is just like part, I'm gonna talk part one, okay, uh, nonlinear algorithms, part two. So uh, it's an area called uncertainty quantification. It's actually a big, big area in applied mathematics. And, and the third one is just Schrodingerization. Because I remember John always told me like, the most important thing is think of a good title. So, so that, that, so that, that's my, uh, <laughs> um, and I just have random John quotes that they're not necessarily that related to the talk, but, um, but quantum Schwantum theory, I think that's, that's very John. Um, okay, so, so uh, what's the use of uh, non-linear non systems? Well, uh, tons of applications. Okay, the most famous is Navier Stokes, but also in gas dynamics, molecular dynamics, financial markets, and um, also machine learning. Uh, but, but what is so hard about them? Okay, so, well, uh, the essence comes down to its unpredictability. Okay, so there's a breakdown of perturbation theory if you have high nonlinearity. So what that means is, so there's a theorem by Bruns, for example, that if uh, you have perturbation theory that converges in the neighborhood of one point, then you're guaranteed that it diverges at another point. Okay, so it's fundamentally um, unpredictable. So for linear systems, if you have, if you, you know, have the behavior, you know, uh, it could be asymptotically, you know, dying down. And, and then, you know, after you, you say you, you waited a long enough time, you think that's, that's how it's going to behave forever. Okay, but the feature of nonlinear systems is that even if you wait, you know, like, um, say 10 years, and then suddenly, right, it's going to behave very, very differently. So, so that's one of the signatures. So uh, with the difficulty in nonlinear systems is that uh, with its predictability is that it should be um, predictable after a long time period. And this is something that people, like at least in some works, they, they kind of ignore. They just say, oh, you know, it works in this short time period. But that's, that's exactly where nonlinear is not as interesting, right? It's, it's in the long time limit. That's really unpredictable. Uh, there, the appearance of discontinuities and shock solutions and singularities. Okay, so you see that a lot like in geometric optics, for example, like forming cusps, that sort of thing. Um, and, and just a note on the bottom that there are often statistical methods are employed. So, so here, like the output of what you want is really the ensemble behavior, okay, rather than the individual solutions. And I'll talk about that um, later. Okay, so, so is it possible to have quantum advantage in solving nonlinear uh, ODs and PDs? So first of all, what do we mean by solve? Because actually it's very different from what the classical people mean. Uh, what do we mean by advantage? And, and thirdly, how do we embed the nonlinearity? Okay, because we know that quantum mechanics is, is fundamentally linear. Uh, oh, Dan, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, just, just a reminder of what ODs and PDs are. Okay, so, so on the left, we have a system of D, um, ordinary differential equations. So we have one unknown variable, uh, X, and then F is some nonlinear function, okay, of, of X. Oh, oh sorry. Um, oh, Dan. Oh, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> okay, cool, thanks, um, next. Um, so, uh, and, and just notice here that we wanna work with nonlinear ODs, but with M different initial conditions. So, th so that will be important uh, later. Uh, for, for D plus one dimensional PDs, now you, you, you have um, a variable, but then uh, the parameters that you can um, vary with respect to that's uh, D plus one, okay? The plus one just, just time for simplicity. And F is again a nonlinear function, but not just of U, but also of its derivatives. Okay, uh, next. Thank you. So with classical solutions, of course, what you mean is, you know, at a, you know, some particular final time uh, and, you know, at, you know, um, special spatial position, we want the actual solutions. Okay, but actually in quantum, uh, that's, that's very, very hard to do. That's usually what, it not, what is meant. If you see papers with titles, okay, we solve, um, you know, differential equations in quantum, this is actually not, not what's happening. What's happening is that 
uh, uh, one is preparing quantum states whose amplitudes are proportional. They're not even equal because you have a normalization constant. They're proportional to um, that of the classical solutions. Okay, so if you actually want the full classical solution, you have to do like you know, tomography. You, you really have to read out uh, these states. Now, the problem there is that if you have some quantum advantage in preparing these states, uh, you, you, you're going to lose it, right, uh, if you're going to read the classical solutions out. Uh, so, uh, so I think what is more reasonable instead is it's asking too much to compare exactly one to one. But if you, if you ask, you know, why classical people care about, you know, ODs and PDs, they're not necessarily caring about the full solutions, like all the time. Usually you just want some output observable, right? So things like average energy, like average momentum, things like that. Uh, next. Uh, so, so then it makes sense to sort, like to compare one to one on, you know, a lesser problem, which is comparing, you know, important physical observables. Okay, because then you don't, Yes. Um, so, so, so here it's real. I mean, it depends on your on your ODE or PDE, right? Oh, it, it, yeah, because if, if that T means time, then then this is this is that time. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. Yeah, but but only if that T in your original ODE that that or PDE that means. Like you interpret that to be time, yes. And next, uh, so but what do we mean? Like what do we mean? Advantage? Well, um, the the cost again is not one to one because like classically the cost means we're counting the number of numerical steps, uh, but the quantum cost uh, we care about things like query complexity. So we assume like these black boxes and you know how many times we query, um, and our gate com complexity. You know the number of you know one two qubit gates. Okay, so, uh, so, but, and then once we get uh, those in terms of the parameters on the bottom, which is like little d, dimension, capital D, number of like ODEs, uh, epsilon, the error to which you might want to know your final observable, capital T, your final time, and M, which is the, the number of initial conditions, right? Uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm not including, um, yeah, these, yeah. Well, we, we, we can actually, because I'm coming to Macquarie on Thursday, right? so there's really a lot here. Like, there are so many caveats here, by the way. I'm just not going through them just for, you know, just for time. But yeah, but I think there's really a lot to discuss on, like, how to do the resource counts properly in that. It's, yeah, just for simplicity, I'm just going to, yeah. Next. Okay, so, so are nonlinear problems even suitable for quantum computation? Okay, so because I know computation is physical, uh, and uh, quantum computation is quantum mechanical, and quantum mechanical uh, process is linear. Next. Uh, so there are two possible routes we can go. Okay. Well, one is, well, make the problem look linear. Okay, so, so you can fit it okay, into uh, linear quantum mechanics. Uh, and the second part is, well, just don't use fundamental quantum mechanics. Okay, so because we know like, things like gauss bedgevsky and all, like they're nonlinear quantum mechanics. So uh, next. So for, uh, so the second route, um, well, there, 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 well, thank you, Dan. Um, there are some arguments uh, uh, against that. I mean, I, I don't have time to go into a lot of these. So I'll just say very, very quickly. So uh, Abrams and Lloyd in 1998, so uh, you can prove, so the, the feature about uh, nonlinear non evolutions, they give two states that are very close, like initially, after a very short period of time, uh, like th they can go far apart very, very quickly. Okay, so, and you can map that into uh, a search a problem and you can solve sharp p problems, right? And we don't believe that uh, quantum computing is as powerful as that, okay? So, so from these kind of constraints, we don't really, uh, we should, you know, uh, these computers, I guess, are only valid at a short period of time. But what I was saying before with nonlinear evolution, we really care about what's happening at the long time because that's, that's what the difficult uh, part is. Um, so, and, and Barry told me like about like, like his work on like doing, uh, like even doing something simple like Hadamard gates, like on only quantum mechanics is not like that straightforward. Uh, I, did, I didn't know about like all the subtleties, you can ask him about it. But you know, Hadamard is like the simplest thing you can do. So if you can't, if you know, you have to question Hadamard, so then how are you gonna do the rest of the computation? Okay, so, so then of course, then we um, make, try to make the problem look linear. But there are different ways of making things look linear. Okay, so, and, and I separate um, two types. So one is through the root of approximations. Uh, and the other one through exact mapping or like what I call linear representation. So, so approximation is something that we're very familiar with. Uh, you know, Kirsten talked about machine learning and, and there in there you have, you know, a lot of uh, fitting, okay?
okay? So, so if, you know, if your data is really nonlinear, okay, you try and fit a straight line, then you know you're gonna get a lot of errors. Uh, there's another type, oops, um, th there's another kind of approximation, which is something like a perturbative expansion, like a Taylor, like, um, like these type of techniques. But then of course, it's only valid uh, in a very small region. And I, and I said before, you know, you really want it for, um, for a long time okay, in a large region. Uh, there's another set of techniques, which is under the term of linearization. Okay, and, and for these, you uh, change basis. So instead of looking at the solutions, you, you look at um, the full set of observables. Uh, and then the full set of observables, they um, map uh, linearly. However, generally you need an infinite number of them. Okay, so you would have, if you want to work on finite dimensional systems and you really have to truncate, and then by truncating, you're losing information. Okay, so, so what's the feature of these approximations that you're losing information about the nonlinearity. Uh, so, but what we want to do is something called an exact mapping. So, so the question is, can we map our system to a high dimensional space, but not infinitely high, because for infinite, like we have to truncate, okay? So we're losing information. Is there a way to map that into a finite dimensional system, and hopefully not too high, that we can capture any um, degree of nonlinearity? Okay, so, so we, don't, we don't lose information on that. Um, uh, so so there, there is one, uh, uh, so, so, so before this paper, like the, the most famous example is that of Kohoft. I, I, I don't know how many guys um, heard about this. Uh, if you search for literature, this is like the only example that people talk about, like, uh, and it's specifically for like a 2D uh, Burgess um, equation. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but we want it to be, you know, a little bit more general okay, than that. All right, so, so before then, I just want to talk about how you do, like, um, how you use quantum devices to, even to do linear ODs and PDs before we, we do nonlinear. Uh, and it's, uh, a lot of it is based on the quantum linear systems problem, okay? And it's usually said that quantum computers are very good at matrix inversion. So, and, and I put that in quotation marks, as you will see later what I mean. So if we have a matrix, um, you know, uh, two, two M by two M uh, matrix, we want to invert that, okay? So we want, we want to find the solution um, X. Uh, and the claim is that, uh, so a classical algorithm, it, um, it runs like polynomial in two of M. It's actually the best, it's slightly less than power three, it's like 2.7 or, or something like that, but you know, you, you, like roughly that. Uh, and if your matrix M obeys certain like nice properties, things like it's sparse and has good condition number and so on, then it can be up to logarithmic. Okay. But, um, but I put solving again um, in quotation marks because it doesn't exactly do this. Okay, you don't have to read, people who like to read the details can read, but you can just look at the picture um, if you don't want to. So uh, it doesn't actually do this. What it does is it prefers a quantum state. Okay, so, so your X and Y, uh, the, the vectors, they're embedded in the amplitudes, okay, of the states like um, ket X and, and ket, um, ket Y. Uh, and the task, so when it says you're doing matrix inversion like efficiently, it means that you're preparing the state, quantum state X. Uh, and if you want to ask the complexity, you know, how many times is particular oracle queried? Uh, and, and just for, uh, for people in the room who, who care exactly like it's sparse access, but we can talk about that later. Um, but again, this is not the solution of the original classical problem. So what do we do? Um, so, so Barry termed this like schlep. <laughs> I've, I've been using it like since. Um, so, so it's saying, well, uh, of course, we don't care about the state X, but we, what we do care about are observables. Okay, so if we have, uh, um, you know, some observable G, okay, so we care about this inner product. And this is the number that we can compare to the original classical problem. Okay, um, all right. Uh, yeah, so, and again, you know, how many times the oracles occurred, and then it's not just like M for oracles, but also uh, G. Okay, so, so then how, how do we apply this to ODs and PDs? So, uh, and here we have to look for numerical solutions, and this is what, you know, um, actual, you know, classical mathematicians do all the time. I, I'm, I'm working with, you know, um, PDE people. So they're, uh, they're very picky about this. So um, uh, you, you discretize your system. Of course, there are lots of different types of discretizations. Um, they're the most popular, something called finite difference. And, it, and it's basically, if you have, you know, dx like dy, then that's really delta x, delta y. Okay, so it's like rise over one, like the, and, and, you, and, you, and you choose the delta of x to be very small. Well, and the smaller you choose it, the more accurate your numerical solution is going to be. Uh, but if it's a linear uh, differential equation, okay, so, so both uh, uh, ordinary or partial, then you can um, transform that into a linear systems problem. And then, you know, you can insert that into, um, you know, the, the matrix inversion one, or you can um, find the inner product okay, that way. 
All right, so, and with these finite difference methods, if you classically want the solution, okay, you see that it's exponential, okay, uh, um, in D, which is the, the dimension of, of the PD, okay, and epsilon is the error. Uh, and, uh, you know, subject to caveats, again, uh, if you want to compare, like, the quantum state whose amplitudes correspond to the solution, you see that it's polynomial, okay, uh, uh, D1 on epsilon. Okay, so, so, so then that, that gives you an, you an idea, hey, you know, if uh, a particular classical, um, you know, protocol uh, is able to solve a particular problem that we have by moving into a slightly high dimension, right? You see that, you know, because the quantum doesn't have the same curse of dimensionality problem, we, it's kind of, you know, suited, you know, exactly for, for quantum devices, okay? And, and so you get the best of both worlds, right? Both the, you know, both the curse of dimensionality issue and whatever other issue you're trying to solve. So, so in this case, it would be uh, nonlinearity. Okay, so, so with approximations, um, uh, so recently it's become very popular, actually. Um, so the first one was actually in 2008, uh, and, and, and but that paper is, you know, uh, has been ignored, like sort of, unfortunately. Uh, but, but again, all of this is in, you know, approximations. But uh, what we want to do is, oh, next. Thanks, Ben. We, we, uh, so we want to go along the exact mapping route. Okay, uh, next. Uh, and, and, and this is, but of course, exact mapping, like, is too much to hope for to be able to do all the PDs. And this is what I learned from working with uh, applied mathematicians, like, who actually work on PDs. Uh, and every PD is, like, is treated very, very differently. So it's, it's, it's like, a, you know, a biologist, you know, someone who studies elephants, you know, are not the same people who studies, you know, crocodiles. Like, they're, you know, they're treated very, very differently. But, um, so, but somehow, I think for physicists, uh, like especially quantum, like they somehow think all PDs are kind of the same, that you just have different, you know, you know, number of derivatives and whatever, but it's, it's very, very different. And, and, and it makes a lot of sense because, you know, all the laws that we know in terms of, you know, ODs and PDs, and you know, it's very different physics, right? So, so why should we treat them in the same way? Uh, so, and, and a very important class of these PDs, so one is called Hamlin jacobi okay, PDs, and another one is called like scalar hyperbolic or PDs. Uh, and, and this is kind of flow chart on you know, what, what we're going to do. So if we start off with a d plus one dimensional nonlinear PD, now with m initial conditions, this is important. Um, so if we start off with these hamlin jacobi nonlinear uh, PDs, we, we can actually find uh, this linear representation mapping. So it's called a level set formalism. We change to a 2d plus one, okay, dimensional linear PD, uh, and with one initial condition. Okay, so, so and, and I think, I think that, that, that is kind of cool because I haven't seen that um, before. Uh, and, then, and then essentially you're solving this 2D plus one. You just, you know, uh, it's not even, uh, you're not increasing dimension by that much, just multiply by two, right? Um, and then you put this into a quantum algorithm to output observable to some position, um, epsilon. Uh, if you start off with this, uh, and Hamish Jacobi would call um, you know, Hamiltonian systems, except uh, there's a bit of a subtlety, you know, that we, we're not, it's not exactly Hamiltonian what we're looking at. But uh, scalar hyperbolic PDs are certainly not Hamiltonian systems. And, and for these, you just need to increase the dimension by one, right? And then you get to um, a linear PD, again, with one initial condition. Okay, so, so here, you know, not only is there uh, an advantage with, with respect to dimension, but also with M, right? Because, you, now, now you've, uh, because the observables we care about are ensemble averages. So if you remember saying at the beginning with nonlinear problems, often we care about ensemble average observables, not the like trajectories of you know, each, each individual solution. So, so then here we also save on M. You know, because in like the, the original case, it's, it will be linear in M because you have to solve the equation M times, but then uh, uh, in this transformed way, you just need to solve it once, okay? So it's independent now of, of M. Uh, okay, so in just some applications, you know, in case you think it's still a very specialized PD, okay, so um, happens a lot in optimal control, machine learning, some of the types of limit rating equations, geometric optics, main field games, problem propagation, sticky particles, pressureless gas, that's important for astrophysics. Uh, uh, the last one's a bit more particular, okay, <laughs> okay, KVC equations. Um, okay, so, uh, and just, so you see the form, okay, what the F, the nonlinearity is, okay, so on the left, Hamlin Jacobi, on the right, uh, hyperbolic. Okay, so, so what is this level set um, kind of mapping? Okay, so, uh, so we define a function, okay, it's called a level set function, uh, and it's, uh, it's in uh, like, like roughly twice as dimension, so it's like really adding a phase space. So this is why it's called adventures in, in phase space, that uh, if your P 
if the, your new you know, parameter P is equal to your solution, then that hits the zero of, of this level set. Okay. Um, and you think, okay, that, that's a bit weird. Okay, where, where are we going with this? Well, what's quite magical, okay, is that this level set function solves a linear PD, okay? So even though your U is actually originally nonlinear, and this is exact, like we haven't, like um, we, this is not numerical at all, it's still on the dynamical level. Uh, and then you say, okay, well, do we just put in the linear systems, um, you know, algorithm with that? Well, like, no, because well, what are we gonna do with that? Like, I, I don't know, <laughs> like, well, what, what this guy is. So even though we, we get this state, like, how do we um, map that to the observables that, that we care about? So for this, uh, let, uh, let's make another transformation. Okay, so, so we have the level set, uh, and then we have a sum, okay, so um, uh, of a delta function on the level set, and we call this psi. And, and I put this one over m here, it can, it can actually be a weighted average, it doesn't have to be one over m. But, but see here now, our initial condition, right, um, has this ensemble average already in there, which means it doesn't actually appear now this m in the equation itself. So because now this solves uh, a linear PD, okay, a very similar looking linear PD, and the M, like the initial conditions, all, all, it's just one now, okay, and it's all an ensemble average of the, of the initial condition, okay. So, so basically we have, you know, uh, we have a nonlinear, um, uh, a nonlinear uh, PD in, with M initial conditions, and now it's a linear PD with a single initial condition. Okay, so, and how do we turn this into an observable that we care about? Well, uh, and, and this is the magic of delta functions, okay? So with, uh, with these observables, you can actually show that uh, if, you, if you take the inner product, basically, I mean, the, these integrals basically inner products for uh, quantum algorithms, then we can uh, get our observable. Because our psi, like this new function, kind of acts like a Wigner function, okay? So, so if you look in um, you know, different types of equations, for example, if you look at nonlinear Howard Jacobi equations, WKB approximation, then you know, this G you know, corresponds to our observables. You have other examples, um, and especially high frequency limits of general hyperbolic systems. Uh, yeah, so there are a lot, a lot of examples in there. Okay, uh, and then, you know, I, I'm not gonna go through the details because the rest is kind of um, uh, canonical. Like, yeah, you know, you, now you can do the discretization, right? And then solve um, it uh, in the way I was saying before. Okay, so, so the result is, so the classical algorithm, if you use finite difference, like these type of methods, you see again, uh, you have this exponential kind of in D, like in all these places. Now in the quantum, uh, now you see it's now polynomial. And of course, like some of the, ca oh my God. Okay, sorry, I just realized I, okay, I, um, okay, I'm gonna, yeah, and, and then we see this is like independent of M. Okay, I'm not gonna go, so it's, uh, we can do it for general PDs as well, but I won't, I won't talk about that. Okay, I'm gonna very quickly, I'm not gonna talk about uncertainty quantification. Okay, I'm gonna very quickly talk about this. Okay, so this is, this is the latest thing. So, um, uh, so this is a technique for using purely quantum simulation to uh, solve a, a non-Schrodinger differential equation. Because what you saw before was using matrix inversion methods, like to solve um, ODs and PDs. But you know, is there a way of you know, really transforming non-Schrodinger equations into Schrodinger equations? Okay, so, uh, uh, and the Schrodinger-like form, you have I, you know, du dt is equal to H, where H is some Hermitian matrix U. Uh, and if we want to do quantum simulation, what we mean is like a way of, you know, realizing e to the minus iht. Okay. All right, and, and there are, you know, some theorems like on that, uh, and a lot of people here like who work on this, like Marek and Yuval, like they um, uh, know a lot about this, so what their like Fourier complexity and all of that, okay, is, and it's linear in T, but that's, um, okay, so, but of course, general um, linear partial differential equations are not of that form. Okay, so like Schrodinger, like is, you know, your L operator, okay, it's this form, but with a heat equation with a source, you see it, it kind of looks like Schrodinger, but then there's an I missing, right? Uh, and if we discretize, uh, so it's of the same form as before, uh, you see the A there is not Hermitian in general. Okay, so how, how do we turn that um, into like a Schrodinger-like equation so we can use quantum simulation? Uh, and I'll do a warm-up heat equation example. Um, I, I worked a lot on this pun, so ha ha ha. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, so one of the popular methods for um, like turning like a heat equation into a Schrodinger-like equation is a wick rotation. So it's called the imaginary time uh, methods. So it's just basically t, and you go minus like or like it. It's like oh okay. But that, that, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's neat. I mean, it's, yeah, you just <laughs> get rid of the eye that way. 
but um, but if, but actually, if, if you evolve the imaginary time in T, they do not give you the solution to the heat equation in time T. Like like the um, so they, they they don't evolve in the same way. So if you uh, want to evolve your you know Schrodinger like corresponding Schrodinger equation in time T, you can't then map that like directly on the solution of the heat equation that you want. Okay, which is what you want. I mean, the the ways to get around it, which is you know at every time step, you know the the recent proposal, which is a, a Nature paper, that they you do tomography at every time step to kind of find out the next Hamiltonian that corresponds to your original equation. But you see that that's really not very neat. For um, uh, so is there a real time way to Schrodingerize the, the heat equation okay. uh, in such a way that it also mimics the actual evolution of your, your original uh, heat equation? Uh, and so this is a proposal here. So we introduced something called a warped phase transformation. Uh, I got this because I used to work on high energy physics. You know, some, I don't know if you guys heard about the random tundra model, but it's like we live in a, we live in a world with an extra dimension that is warped. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of like compactified, but like, you know, th things far away have less influence on the, on the three plus one dimension. Anyway, so, so what it means is that you, ha uh, uh, your, your, uh, you have your original U solution. You just multiply by e to the minus P where P is just one extra dimension. This is kind of, yeah. And it's kind of warped because, you know, the further you go, you know, you, um, you go away from your, uh, origin. Okay. Um, then uh, it's less effective. Uh, so, so why do we care about this warp phase transformation? Um, well, uh, your heat equation now turns into uh, this heat equation in phase space. Okay, and, and the trick here is that you can turn, yeah, okay. Um, uh, and, and the trick here is that you can uh, turn your, your um, W into like a minus uh, derivative in P. Now, the interesting thing is if you take a Fourier transform, okay, on this, you get a Schrodinger-like equation. Okay, so, so, so the only, um, thing like that's different is that you have this eta, okay? But this eta is real, firstly. Uh, and it's saying it's really a system of Schrodinger equations where you're changing, you're dilating time by, by a real value, okay? But, but it's still now like, you know, Schrodinger's uh, equations. Um, and again, if you want, you, you can discretize this so you can, you know, solve this um, using quantum simulation. And, and here you can do this kind of the usual way. Okay, so you Schrodingerize, okay, um, the form, which means now you're sorting for this W tilde and preparing the W tilde state. And then there's a way of then mapping back to, to your U state in quite a straightforward way. Uh, and, and so the theorem, okay, so, so like this is the statement of the theorem, okay, well then what the cost is, okay, using quantum simulation to get the solution of what you want. And everything here is like, you know, um, done in the unitary unitary way. So, so what is the use of this? So, so I was trying to think about, you know, quantum applications, because it's not just for classical problems where we uh, want to solve, you know, these non-trading like P, um, PDs or ADEs, because it's also useful for, for quantum problems, like to have non-unitary evolution. And one example is quantum ground state preparation. So if you start off with some initial state, say um, a U of naught, and you evolve like non-unitarily, like e to the minus ht, then you know in the long time limit, you actually go, you end up in the ground state. Okay, so, uh, uh, and, and of course if you, but if you do this in Schrodinger way, like e to the iht, then if you run time, you know, for a long time, you're not gonna get to the ground state, okay? So, so this dissipative dynamics is useful also for quantum problems. So, so then if you use the Schrodingerization like method, you find that, uh, well, this is the cost where, you know, alpha or not is the overlap, between your initial state with the with the ground state, uh, your delta is your spectral gap, and epsilon is the error. Okay, uh, and and this is so. So there are also other methods for doing this, like you know quantum phase estimation, and this is not worse than quantum phase estimation. <laughs> I, I can't say it's better because I think the um, the near optimal uh, limit is actually one over the overlap and delta. So I don't think it can get any better actually, um, like with respect to those parameters. Uh, there's also Gibbs state preparation, of course, but with that, you need to assume you start off with a uh, superposition of like your energy eigenstates in an entangled form. So, but, but suppose you have that, then you can also do ground state, uh, oh, Gibbs state preparation. And again, the scaling in terms of the number of energy states and the partition function that's um, corresponds to the best algorithms kind of know as well. Okay. I, and again, I don't know of any optimality results, if any of you guys know about that, but um, as far as I know, this is the best one. Uh, you can also, another example is uh, if you want to simulate, uh, you know, observables or quantum uh, systems in random media, okay, in the semi-classical limit. So in this kind of case, the uh, semi-classical limit of Wigner functions, it obeys a uh, transport equation. 
and, uh, and here you will get uh, a state whose amplitude corresponds to your Wigner function. And then there's quite a simple way of getting your observables like from that. Okay. Um, so you don't need to get, so we don't need to be fixated because I think there's a prejudice. We're fixated with the idea of getting the wave function and then getting the observable. But there's also another way. If you just want the observable, you can get another different state that you know, has nothing to do with your, um, your wave function itself. But then you can, so long as there's a way of getting to your observable, that, that's all you need. Okay, so, um, uh, and, and then we have a more general formalism. So you give me any uh, PDE, you can always uh, write them down as a system of ODs. Uh, and your A can be anything now, it's not, it's not necessarily um, uh, Hermitian, it can, uh, but, but any operator can be written as, you know, just a sum, okay, of uh, a Hermitian and anti-Hermitian, okay, form. Uh, and then you can show that this reorganization um, also works like in that. Uh, so these are the series of papers, and so thanks to my uh, collaborator, Sir Xu Ching and uh, Francois Pierce, they're, they're really, really great. Um, are applied mathematicians. I'm going to visit Francois in Paris a bit later. Uh, and my postdoc Terence, who did a lot of the you know hardcore um, simulations and all of that. So the take-home message: I, I think it's useful for us to think about uh, transforming problems into a, you know slightly higher dimensional phase space uh, and give it a quantum treatment. Like like that's kind of the theme, you know, because you know you can uh, solve nonlinear problems. I didn't talk about the stochastic ones, but you can also uh, make them deterministic, and you can Schrodingerize you know any um, any equation. Uh, whoops, uh, next. Uh, so I'm in Shanghai Jiao Tong. So I, I've been told on the 8th of January, um, uh, like there are no quarantines for foreigners. So, um, <laughs> so, you, so you're welcome to, to come and visit. Uh, and, and I have available PhD and postdoc positions in my group. Um, next. Um, and, and this is the final kind of activity slide. Um, so maybe we'll leave that till later, but John hid his thing in there. So, so we'll leave that till later. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the very interesting talk. We are a little bit over time, but we have only uh, two sessions in this. Uh, I'll yeah, be around all here. week, by the way. So, uh, yeah, we have some time for questions. Um, so, so it, it comes down to the uh, warped phase transformation. So, so here you 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 added a dimension p, but, but only only one dimension here. So, if you want to now embed this in a quantum state, yeah, like it's now also in the superposition in terms of like the p variables. Oh, yeah, so yeah. It's actually a model. Yeah, yeah. It's just it just add one more dimension. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I wouldn't say so. So, uh, for you guys who heard about the block encoding techniques, Marika, might ask about that. Yeah, so there's a small model that is actually a model of the block encoding. Okay. Is, okay. Okay. Are you talking about Don An's paper? Like this? Um, yeah, like I like we, we we can discuss this in a bit more detail, um, kind of later. So 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 like this other paper, they use something called a block encoding uh, method. So so which is not like um, it's it's actually better in terms of the um, like dimension because they you know whatever size the matrix is, you just double it. But it's it's really messy like in terms of how to then like transform that into a Schrodinger like Schrodinger like form. So so if I remember the the no, um yeah, it's 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 a. Uh, I'm thinking about it. Like it's a little bit different, like um, uh, in form, because what what they, uh, yeah, I, I yeah, I, I think it's better we talk through the the details. Yeah. Oh, are you, are you talking about yeah yeah okay so 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 that was the first one yeah yeah um I, I think that needs to be investigated because here I haven't I've only talked about linear equations here because once you do nonlinear you need to do another mapping right right so um and yeah so so this isn't a longer version of the paper like we did only a nonlinear like ODE form but 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 th th there's another there's another problem so um here I said uh for for general formalism of linear ODEs but if you want to solve a PDE problem uh, of course all PDEs can be transformed into a system of linear PDEs but it's like exponential 
right? Right. So, so then you're going to get an exponential factor in there. So the, uh, the best method, uh, which is the level set the formulas I was talking about before, you like you directly, you don't need to have this exponential overhead. You're directly mapping a, PD, a nonlinear PD into a linear PD, right? And, and um, so you don't end up getting this exponential overhead. But I think with the, um, yeah, because I, I actually thought a lot about the, um, the, uh, the fundamental limitations, like, of, yeah, so it'll be good to, to discuss. Yeah. Yes, that's not easy to do, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, quantum, 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 yeah. So, so it's not like a near term thing because quantum Fourier transforms are not <laughs> a near term. Oh yeah, so oh yeah, so so a big caveat with all algorithms like um, associated with all these like how how do you put the input state right? Because like you can use Q like de depending on how you embed it, if it's like um, amplitude encoding, so the initial states are encoding the amplitude of the initial states. It depends on how many non-zeros uh, non-zero values there are. So if it's um, if it's just you know one non-zero value, then then that's that, that's easy. That's like zero or, or one. Uh, but if it's very many, then the cost can be exponential. Right, so, so it's a caveat that I've hidden. Um, I mean, I, I don't hide it deliberately, it's just not enough time. But um, uh, there's a factor which uh, has to do with how sparse your initial condition is. I, I don't know if I can find it. Uh, well, well, this is for something else, but um, yeah, but you can see like a B range. So, so you, you have some conditions on your initial data. So that, um, you know, if you still want like this exponential uh, improvement, or if you want, if you want polynomial, then you can have slightly enlarged our initial data. But we can talk more about like the, the actual details of that. But yeah, but there is a condition on the initial data if you want to, if you also want to prepare the initial state um, properly. But the good thing about quantum, like the reason why I didn't talk about classical application of Schrodingerization, but quantum problems is that in quantum, uh, at least for ground state preparation, your initial state is given for free. Like you don't need to worry about the initial state preparation because someone just says, turn this state into a ground state. Okay, so someone like already gave that to you and you don't even need to know the classical, um, well, I mean, you don't need to know like a good estimation of the overlap, okay, between the ground state, but that's all you need to know. 